Test, test. All right. All right, everybody. Time for another talk. Uh, filter on in. Um, just to, just to re-warn you, those of you sitting way over here at stage right, there's a lot of noise that comes in from the sponsor area. It's going to make it difficult for you to hear. You probably want to be in one of these three zones if you are interested in hearing what, uh, what Mark has to say. If you're, if you're just surfing a chair, feel free to stay there. Or you're welcome to, uh, I, I want everybody to know, despite my warning about uh, you'll get tasered and arrested if you run out on the field, you are welcome to go out through these doors and hang out in the bleachers. It's, uh, it's uh, beautiful in 68 degrees or something out there right now. So uh, feel free and hang out in the outside if you want to take a call or check email or whatever the deal is. Um, so hold on to your hunger. Lunch is coming after a talk. Uh, we're going to have a uh, talk about APIs from Mark McLeod of the Clan McLeod. Uh, that's uh, Stoplight, a uh, local Austin company. Uh, or, uh, yay, Austin startups. Woo. That's the proper response. Uh, and uh, uh, is gonna, they, work, uh, they work with APIs. So, so far this morning, uh, we've done uh, serverless apps, we've done microservices, and now APIs. So, a, a tour de force of development technology. Uh, with that, I will hand it off to Mark. All right. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Mark McLeod, and I'm the founder of, as he was just uh, saying, a local startup here in Austin called Stoplight. A little bit of background on myself. Oh, there we go. A little bit of background on myself. Uh, I've been working with APIs for the better part of a decade, um, whether that's consuming them, building them, uh, consulting for companies on their API processes and strategies, or most recently, uh, building tooling for APIs. And the topic of today's talk is DevOps meets APIs um, and the concept of modeling once and benefiting everywhere. So if you guys just watched Brian's talk, he kind of alluded to the idea of a structural contract for your API. And so we'll be doing a deep dive into that and all the ways that that can help you in your organization. So as I was preparing for this talk, I realized that I didn't really have a formal notion of what, what is DevOps. So I was looking around the internet and it turns out that there are a lot of different ways that people describe DevOps. Um, and no one has any like, real conclusion on exactly what it is. And after looking around quite a bit, I ended up on, on Wikipedia, of all places. Um, and even this one sentence had three citations. I don't, they couldn't even figure it out themselves. But um, if we look here at this quote, I'll just read it out for you. It aims at establishing a culture and an environment where building, testing, and releasing software can happen rapidly, frequently, and more reliably. So I thought that this generally captured what I thought of as DevOps. But just to make sure, I wanted to go through an exercise to make sure that this applies to APIs and all the stuff that I'm going to be talking about with maximizing efficiency in APIs. So let's go back to the beginning here. And we'll start with me. I'm a, I'm a solo coder by myself. I'm coding away in my, my dark, dark cave. Um, it's no testing, no nothing. I'm reasonably productive. Um, and there's a minimal, you know, minimal efficiency loss because it's just me. I'm not perfect, but there's some there. Um, but generally, there's not much efficiency to value loss there. Now I bring in a buddy, another developer, and he's about as good as me. We double our value production, but we more than double our efficiency loss because he brings his own efficiency loss, and then there's loss uh, between the two of us in the friction that's involved with, I, you know, not all the code is mine. I got to learn his code. We got to talk back and forth, make pull requests, et cetera. So there's some efficiency loss there. Now our company's growing. We have more people, and we start breaking up into departments. So now we have the efficiency loss of the individuals and the efficiency loss between the departments. It's their communication. They have to coordinate on releases, on deployments, et cetera. And often one department will influence another department. As our technology grows and gets more complex, we start kind of expanding the products. And maybe we start breaking it up into services, adding background processes, an orchestration layer, and so on and so forth. So our product grows in scope and complexity. Our value goes up, but we keep introducing new potential inefficiencies. So our efficiency loss keeps going up. And when I think about DevOps, I think of this orange bar here. So this is what we're really trying to maximize. And thus far, we've been maximizing it by 
adding processes or people to increase our value, but at the same time, we increase our efficiency loss. And when I think of DevOps, I think of this purple. I think of going the other way. So we're going down. We're trying to minimize or, or temper this efficiency loss that you get when you start increasing the complexity and scope of your operations and your technology. So if we go back to this quote, I, I like to think of it more as getting rid of, so you can get rid of this part of the sentence. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish a culture and an environment that maximizes predictable efficiency. So it tries to get rid of that efficiency loss, that red in that graph. And that's what I want to talk about today in the context of APIs. So um, if we look at this graph, this is pretty much this is like the quintessential you know, API growth graph. I'm pretty sure it's been in use for the last three years um, by the entire industry. And most of you have probably built with or at least consumed or worked with one or more APIs. They're pretty much everywhere these days. And as was alluded to in the, or talked about in the first talk today, uh, APIs are, we're breaking up these services into smaller services. So we go from large services to microservices, from microservices to serverless, or basically breaking it up into functions um, and going smaller and smaller and smaller. And this has the potential to increase uh, DevOps complexity because really they're just more discrete parts to keep track of and manage throughout the organization. So if we zoom in on the API process, let's take a quick look at what's involved in the API ecosystem, starting from the simplest API all the way up to you know, a full-fledged organization with multiple parts and moving pieces. So again, it's just me. I'm coding. Um, probably not writing tests because I think I know all the code and I'm iterating quickly and I'm just lazy and I don't want to write any tests. So it's very simple. I'm just building the API, releasing it. Everything's going great. Now another developer joins the team and all of a sudden we need to write tests. So I want to make sure that my code doesn't break his code, so I'm writing tests. Now we want other people to build on our API. So we need to write documentation so that they know how to use the API. And we obviously want them to have a great onboarding experience. So they need to be able to prototype against our API very quickly. SDKs will help with that. So now we need to hire some developers, build, you know, build some Go, Python, Java, Node, whatever you want to build for these SDKs. So now our organization is growing and it's time to enforce some compliance. So we need to put some rules in place to make sure that across the board we're enforcing kind of consistent patterns and behaviors uh, throughout all of our APIs that all of our team is building, especially as they churn over time. We want the new employees to build APIs in the same way that our old employees did across the board. And of course we need to monitor our APIs. Basically we need to test them in production um, and or do something with production traffic. And this is just some of the pieces uh, that are involved with building an ecosystem around APIs, and these are the pieces that I'll be focusing on today. And then as you move towards microservices, it just compounds the complexity. So now we need to do all of these things for all of the APIs throughout our organization. So problem number one is communication. In a tiny startup, this isn't an issue, but as the org, you know, organization breaks up and, and, and uh, into, di into discrete departments, which are responsible for the most part for different parts of that API ecosystem. You know, you might have a QA department, technical writing, implementation, front end, ops for monitoring, et cetera. And a great deal of friction is introduced to make sure that these departments are communicating effectively and coordinating around release cycles. So if we take just three of these departments, so here on the left, I apologize if it's kind of small, but on the left we have um, a little snippet of code that I wrote, an example test for what's on the right, which is documentation. So the, the screenshot on the right is a screenshot of the Stripe API documentation for one endpoint. On the left is some pseudocode for that endpoint, and on top, we're representing engineering. So who, the question here is, what drives what? So is your organization uh, doing a design-first approach, where the technical writers are specking out, perhaps with an API architect, the API, which then feeds into engineering to implement it, which then feeds into QA? Or are you doing tests first, QA feeds into engineering, or is engineering do it and then they tell the technical writers, oh, we've updated this endpoint, you need to update the docs, this all needs to be coordinated around the re release cycle. If you, if you forget to tell the technical writers that we changed this property, that could go unnoticed for a long period of time until a customer might kind of recognize that this endpoint is not accurately rep represented in your docs. So this in general just introduces inefficiency and it leads to potential inconsistencies and errors at various parts in your kind of API ecosystem and process. 
So problem number two is documentation, or sorry, duplication. <laughs> so if you look at the various parts of the API process, documentation, mocking, uh, testing, SDKs, all of these parts have significant pieces that are the same. Um, whether it's common logic, common descriptors, common definitions, there is the potential for, si for significant duplication throughout all of these pieces of your, your ecosystem. So if we zoom in on just these two parts from the last slide, just testing and docs, you'll notice that on the left, so these tests, it's just a simple request to the uh, Stripe API, and then we're making some assertions on the response, the shape of the object that is, that is returned. So we're checking you know, that the body has an ID that's a string, an object that's a string, an amount that's a number, and so, and so forth. And on the right, we have the documentation. And we see that same object present in our documentation. In fact, behind the screenshot on the left uh, is described the request body, along with kind of requirements, uh, the types of the properties in the request body, descriptors, validations, that sort of stuff. So there's a tremendous amount of duplication in your tests and your docs. And this extends to other parts of the API process. So if we look at mocking, you know, often you're mocking back a, an example of what it should respond, which if you look here at the docs, that's probably exactly what you want in your mocking. Or perhaps you want to dynamically generate your mocking based on the response object shape. And again, if you want your mock server to be a little bit um, smarter, you might do contract testing on the input request, applying the same validations that are in your docs to the request to simulate you know, a server um, capturing an error on a request in. And same for SDKs. So when you generate an SDK or write an SDK, you're exposing an API in that SDK that should accurately represent what's in your docs. So there's a lot of duplication throughout all these parts of the API lifecycle. And problem number three is thoroughness. So it's, it's not easy to be thorough in your tests, to be thorough in your docs, and to be thorough in just all parts of your API process. And this process, this problem is only compounded by problem number two, duplication. So if you have a lot of duplication at all parts of your lifecycle, you, and you want to be thorough, you're going to be duplicating that effort across all those different parts. So this is a naive test, obviously. Um, and it sucks. So we're trying to assert the entire response shape. And we should probably do the same thing with the request shape. Um, but doing this for all of your tests across all your endpoints, you know, some APIs have 300, 400, 1,000 endpoints, um, and maintaining this and making sure that this is actually in sync with your docs and everything else that you're producing is difficult. And what's what ends up happening is that often people don't do it because uh, just the cost isn't worth the benefit for them. And they often end up doing something like this. So I, I've done this. Um, it's just a test that makes a request, checks the response, perhaps even checks the response uh, body property. And this is basically a glorified pingdom. So this is just sending a request to our API. It's like a smoke test. Um, but it feels good because you know, we'll get a coverage report. If we write one of these for every endpoint, you'll have 100% coverage on your, your endpoints. Um, and it'll be green. And ultimately, a lot of teams end up just writing tests like this. But this doesn't really accurately test what you're describing in your documentation, what you're putting forth as your contract to your customers and your prospects and your partners. But writing it the other way is pretty time consuming. So this, is end up, this ends up happening quite a bit. So if we look at these three problems, what we end up with is just a bunch of inefficiencies. So we're increasing that red in that first bar chart. Um, you know, number one, team, team grows, extra friction between teams and departments. Number two, duplication throughout your entire um, API stack. And number three, it's hard to be thorough throughout your API stack because of number two. And we haven't even touched around issues uh, in maintenance. So as your docs change over time or as your API changes over time, how do you make sure that those changes are accurately reflected across all of these different properties? Um, or if you, if you hire somebody new and they look at your documentation and it's 100 pages of documentation describing all the inputs and outputs of your API, how do they know that that documentation is actually still accurate and relevant and in sync with your API? Okay, so we're going to talk about API specifications. This is a DevOps conference, so I'm not sure um, how familiar everyone is with these specifications. So I'm going to just briefly give an overview, um, and then we'll dive right in. So API specifications are basically a structural contract for API, as Brian was alluding to in the previous talk. They describe the inputs and the outputs in a machine-readable format that you can build tooling around and do some cool stuff with. So there's three main ones in the industry, um, Swagger, Ramo, and Blueprint. Ramo and Blueprint both have corporate sponsors, Mulesoft and uh, Apiary. 
Swagger used to be uh, run by SmartBear, but then they donated to the Linux Foundation um, and renamed it to OpenAPI Specification. Um, they each have their pros and cons. Um, RAML and Blueprint are technically, I guess, more readable because they're YAML and Markdown. Now Swagger can be JSON, I guess, or YAML, so that's also kind of readable. Uh, but my favorite is Swagger. It's extensible. It's, I think, I think it's the most popular, but I'm not quite sure. Don't quote me on that. Um, but that's what I'll be using in, in my examples moving forward. So here is an example. Again, apologize for the size. I will describe it at a high level so everyone can understand what's going on here. So here's an example Swagger spec that describes that one uh, create a charge endpoint in that Stripe API. Um, here, the first, the first yellow bar there um, is describes the entire kind of re request structure for that one endpoint. It describes the all the inputs, all the descriptors, all the validations. It's based, it's JSON schema embedded in Swagger. Um, and the second kind of yellow bar there describes the response structures along with examples in the same sort of way. Here we're just describing one, uh, the 201 response, but you could describe all of the error responses as well. So what we end up with is a machine-readable structural contract for this endpoint. And as you can imagine, we can do quite a bit with this thorough description. So if we step back to that Stripe documentation, and we look at what's on the page. In fact, actually, I would say 90% of what's on this documentation page is present in our structural contract. In fact, all of the hard parts. So these are the hard parts to maintain. How do we know that all of these um, response structures and request structures are actually accurate um, and represent what is the current contract of our API? All of this data is in our structural contract, and we can, we can leverage that Swagger or RAML or whatever into the tooling, into our tool chain, and build these sorts of docs off of that Swagger contract. The only thing that's not in there is what Brian alluded to as the behavioral contract. So this um, top left, you know, human text, how do you use it in kind of um, layman terms. So it's pretty cool. So we can leverage this, con you know, that contract to build out these docs. Most of this doc is present in that, in that Swagger spec. If we look over at our tests, again, there's a lot of this uh, code is present or at least described in our spec. So if we look at pretty much all of it, uh, we're sending a request to a particular endpoint. That input with that request body is described in our spec. And then we're making a bunch of assertions against the response, trying to assert the shape of the object that's returned. And all of that data is present in our spec. So again, we can leverage this spec to drive our tests and replace the meat, most of, most of what is in this test. And what ends up happening is your tests end up being shells that just make HTTP requests to your API, and the rest of it is handled by your spec, and all of the assertions are just generated from your spec file. Another cool thing you can do is fuzz testing. So because we have a um, well-described response body with validations, you know, min, max, length, formats, et cetera, we can invert that, to that request body and generate hundreds, thousands of requests with the inversion of what is accepted input to do fuzz testing and catch you know, those edge cases that you might not otherwise catch in your regular tests. Perhaps for some reason, when your username is three characters, it's let through, you know, but you're, it's, supposed to it's supposed to be a, a minimum of five, but four works. So that sort of stuff will be caught in fuzz testing. So we just went over documentation and testing, but the same method, uh, the same idea is present in the rest of the API stack. Mocking, again, example responses, um, that's present in your spec. You can easily spin up a mock server off the spec. In fact, there are a lot of open source libraries that allow you to spin up a mock server off of a, like a Swagger file or a RAML file. And you can go further than like a dumb mock server. You can dynamically generate responses. So you're not limited to just static mock responses in these mock servers that you're providing to customers or partners or whoever might need this mock server. And you can do the contract testing on the input as well to simulate um, what your server, how your server would treat bad request input. So you can make a smarter mock server very easily off of these spec files. SDK generation, this is a controversial topic. Not everybody likes automatic SDK generation, but uh, it's getting better every day. And there's some good companies, API Matic is one, that, that do a pretty good job with SDK generation off of these spec files. And SDKs, again, they're very important for that early stage with your API consumers to make it easy for them to prototype off of your API. 
compliance becomes extremely easy, just write some rules and apply it to your spec. So your spec is JSON, it's well formatted, it's well understood. You can write a system to apply and parse that spec and apply whatever your organizational rules and common patterns and behaviors are against that spec file. If you're always supposed to page with a sort and limit parameter, perhaps you just, you, you just need to write a, a script that will just check your spec file to make sure that that's enforced across those, those endpoints that support paging. And then when a new engineer comes on and they make a mistake and they do sort and skip, um, they'll know immediately that they're building the API the wrong way. Monitoring, so this isn't in use quite as much these days, but you can apply your contract live to requests going through your system. So you can do live contract testing of requests as they pass through your API to identify those one in a million kind of anomalies that you'll never catch in testing. So if that one in a million request, you know, request body is returned in a different shape, you can capture that with contract testing live against all the traffic going through your API to build better monitoring systems, even better analytics. So what you end up with is a single source of truth. So your entire organization could treat the spec file as the canonical contract to your API, and this, will, this can drive the rest of your API processes, all of them. So if you look at these problems again, communication, now all of a sudden, it's not a question of who is in charge of what. There's one file everybody can reference and everybody can update. It's simple JSON or YAML. Anybody that can understand JSON or YAML can update this file and read it. So communication, those inefficiencies are dramatically reduced. Duplication, this is an obvious one. You can use the spec file to power most of your docs. You can generate SDKs. You can get rid of all of the assertions and all of your tests. There's a lot that you can replace with one spec file if you build the tooling around it. And there's quite a bit of open source tooling already that will help you do this. And then thoroughness. So because there's a single place to update, it's easy to be thorough in one place. All of a sudden, it's not so daunting to, to try to describe all of your properties, your entire response, all your input in all these different places across your organization and manage all of those uh, connections. You can be thorough once. Okay, so let's take a quick look at contract testing. So again, looking back to this, the spec that we were describing earlier, I've collapsed the actual contract part of it, so that's up here. So this is describing two endpoints in the Stripe API. And with Swagger, you can add extensions. So here, we're adding an x-test extension that just describes in simple JSON a, an HTTP request. So because our tests are now just basically shells that, mage, that make HTTP requests, um, they're extremely easy to describe in JSON or a structure like Swagger. So here at the top, we're describing the request that we want to make. It's extremely easy. HTTP is a spec, so this isn't hard to write. In fact, anybody can write this. You don't need to be a, you know, a programmer. You could have your technical writer could write your tests. And then right here, we have succinct assertions that leverage our contract. So we're making two assertions here. We're, we're asserting that the response status is 201, just like we were in our test. And then we have an assertion where we're checking that the response body passes the, validates against the contract. So the thing that is up here at the top, we're checking to make sure that that response body, that shape, validates against the JSON schema in our contract. So that, does, that handles all, you know, if, if the response body is 50 properties with a bunch of validations on min, max, length, enums, you know, multiple ofs, formats, all, that's all those sorts of validations can be handled in your contract, and you just make a simple assertion in your test. And you can replace pretty much all of your integration tests with something like this. It's also bi-directional. So previously, when a test failed, it usually meant that your API was broken or something was wrong with your API. Now if a test fails, that either means that your API is broken or your single point of truth, your contract is out of date. So the thing that you generate everything from in your organization, it can tell you whether or not either that's out of date or your tests are broken. So it's kind of a sync manager between your single point of truth and your tests. And then all of a sudden when you hire a new employee, they can run these tests and they'll know immediately if your documentation is actually accurate and reflects your API. It's that contract you're putting forth to the world is true. So what we end up with is one portable file, JSON or YAML, programmatically, uh, it, it, it's machine readable, 
It describes your entire API, inputs and outputs. It's extremely thorough. And you can even do stuff like extend it to add simple test flows to prove that that contract is still valid against your API. It's incredibly easy to maintain. You can version it in GitHub. Um, it's easy to run CI, you know, integrate into your CI process. It's incredibly easy to automate against, and the entire team can read it, understand it, and make changes to it. Um, you can pretty much power your whole organization with a technical writer that just writes this file and writes these simple tests, and they can take care of a lot of the things that you have to manage in your API process today. Okay, so here are two quick examples. I'm not sure if it's gonna be large enough, but two quick examples of leveraging an API spec um, to, so this first one is to spin up a mock server. So this is, let's see here. Oh, oh it is working, okay. Um, so this top one here uh, is using um, some free tech that we have. It is a, a single dependency free binary. You can put it on any machine. You can put it on a new Linux box. It'll just run. Um, and it takes one argument, the spec file. So it can be a local spec file. It can be a URL to a spec file. And it'll spin up a mock server with uh, dynamic validations on the input. So contract testing on the input to simulate server um, request errors. And it can generate your responses dynamically so you're not limited to static responses. It's a pretty cool little mock server that you can pass any spec file into and it'll just spin up, spin up that server for you. The bottom, the bottom screen there is just running t the test that we just described in that swagger file against your spec. So it's very easy to replace um, your integration uh, tests with this sort of system. And since it can take a URL to a spec file, you don't even need to update your CI process. You can just run this, pass it to wherever your spec is, and you can update that as you, as you go um, and as your engineers make changes to your API or as your technical writer makes changes. It's extremely easy to run these tests. So you end up with a system like this. You have one spec file or multiple spec files that generate all of these different parts of your API process. Um, and it, as a bonus, it is very easy to run compliance against it. This is the basis of the kind of model once benefit everywhere approach. It leads to uh, reduced departmental friction since everybody knows where the canonical source of truth is and can update it and read it. Reduced duplication since everything is generated from this one spec file. And you reduce inconsistencies and errors, again, because of the reduced duplication. There's just one place you need to manage and reference, and it's your contract. It's the contract that you're managing internally and that you present to the world th through all your tools. And ultimately, this lowers that red bar. So this is what I think of as DevOps. It gets rid of these inconsistencies and these, these uh, inefficiencies and increases the overall organizational efficiency. All right, that's it. Uh, this is what we do at Stoplight. So if you want to talk to me, just find me after. I'd love to talk about it. I think we have, you know, I have five minutes short, so plenty of time for questions. Thank you. One thirty, something like that. I do have uh, one public service announcement. Uh, this is uh, a smoke-free campus, so even if you go out on the thing, please no smoking or vaping, because they'll fine you or whatever it is they do. So, uh, so uh, check that out. Other than that, we're going to be doing all the ignite talks in here. Uh, one uh, one thirty hackathon is still forming teams. They start hacking at like one twenty-five. So uh, if you all these talks have gotten you feeling like writing code, go down there and hack. <laughs>